Welcome, guys, to Lady Family Live. I, I don't know what session number this is. It's could be seven or eight, maybe nine at this point. Um, this has been really great, a great way to reach you guys and see you know people from all over and connect with people from all over uh, the country, um, especially if you haven't been able to make it out here to Napa. We are um, thrilled to be able to, to come into your kitchen, living room, garage, wherever you're hanging out, backyard. So thanks for, for joining us tonight and coming on. Um, as you can see, uh, I'm not at the winery, at least if you've been to the winery, you've probably never seen a room that looks like this. Uh, I'm at the Poetry Inn. Um, I, the last time we did a poetry episode, we, uh, we were up at the inn. And so we wanted to feature this, uh, this, this venue again, because it's actually gone through a recent refresh. So you can see some of the the new design elements on the on the ceiling here in the in the E.E. E. Cummings suite, which is uh, a nice large suite right off the main uh, main room in in, uh, in in the Poetry Inn. And uh, well, many of the other rooms have different themes. That's one of the directions that Erin Martin, our designer, took. Uh, she took the the sort of the ethos and the the atmosphere that the poets created. So all the rooms here are named after poets, and she kind of took elements of their poetry and um, infused them into the rooms. And so uh, if you're able to come and visit us here, you'll see that uh, in all the different rooms, they all have kind of a different touch. So if you're an avid poetry in visitor, you'll want to kind of hop to different rooms and, and experience them. Uh, but it's really, really beautiful. And of course, you know, this the view is always immaculate. It might take a sec for that lighting to, to come around, but um, you can't get a much better view than from the Poetry Inn. Uh, of course, you are only minutes from the town of Yonville. And, uh, you know, if you like food, if you like wine, this is probably the most beautiful place in all of Napa Valley to stay. So you're just looking down right over that beautiful, beautiful vineyard. So anyway, guys, um, that's where I'm at tonight. Poetry in. We're going to talk pretty much all things poetry. We're going to have Chris Tynan, our director of winemaking, join us. And before we bring Chris on and before we really get into tasting the wines, we're going to taste both the 100 point Woohoo! No, 100 point 2018 uh, Poetry Cabernet. We're going to taste the 2008 as well, uh, which we're doing a little offering of. And um, we're going to take a, a little journey into the vineyard before, before we bring Chris on. So the last little bit of housekeeping I have is that uh, if you are a Platinum Playlist member, you should already have gotten your offer. And you've got uh, till the end of tomorrow to make any add-ons to, uh, to your allocation. So if you want uh, some more large formats, or if you want to pick up some more of those 2008s, which by the way, Cliff is personally signing all the 2008 poetry magnums. So if you want to grab a personalized um, signed bottle from Cliff, uh, we could do that for you. But um, tomorrow's the last day for Platinum. Next week, uh, mid next week, uh, the general uh, email will go out for everybody to acquire poetry. So keep an eye out for that. And uh, we're excited for you guys to all bring this, uh, this amazing wine into your home. So what I really wanted to start this webinar out with is taking you guys into the vineyard and sort of grounding us uh, so we can get a perspective as to, you know, what sort of makes this vineyard so special, because I know Chris will be expanding on that. And so if uh, you can be patient with me for a sec, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here. We had a, a, a really fun day this week on uh, Tuesday. And so hopefully you guys can see this. This is... Uh, uh, we were out in the vineyard with our hospitality team. And so you can see Kelly and Ricardo and, and Rick, uh, some of our, our longtime hospitality members there, uh, out with uh, Allison Wilson, our, our director of vineyards. That's Allison on the left there. Um, here we're on the, on the south side of the vineyard, looking down over uh, into the Cliff Lady um, estate, prop, or Twin Peaks estate, our Valley Floor Vineyard. So right over here, uh, that's where the winery is nestled into the hillside. You've got our vineyard blocks. So if you visit us in the tasting room, you've seen, you know, the Dark Side of the Moon block and Bohemian Rhapsody and uh, Rocket Man, you know, all those blocks down here. And then right across the street uh, towards the towards the east, that's where the poetry vineyard is, that, that hillside vineyard. So we wanted to take the team out there to really help them uh, understand what makes that vineyard so special, let them kick the dirt around and taste the fruit, which by the way, every day getting, you know, sweeter and sweeter, tasting better and better, and we're getting closer and closer to a uh, harvest starting. So there's Allison sort of giving us an introduction. I'll keep moving on here. I'm not sure all the pictures we've got. Here's, uh, you know, later on in our in our tour, we made our way across to the uh, the northern blocks and you can just see how steep this is. Here's Ricardo hanging out with, uh, with now Rick 
up at the top. And I mean, Rick was the only brave soul that, that wanted to go up to the top because it, it's that steep to where, I mean, it's easy to slip in that, in that soil. And, uh, and it, it, it definitely gets your heart pumping when you, when you climb up, uh, up that hill. So super steep slopes, volcanic rock. Uh, Chris will talk more about that, of course, and how it influences the wines. Um, most of this vineyard was, was replanted in the, in the early sort of 2000s era when, uh, when we first acquired the property. And so now these vines getting much more established. Uh, some of the older blocks on this property were planted, um, I believe, in the mid-90s. And uh, Chris still loves those blocks, so I think they're, they're kind of here to stay. Uh, to give you an idea, this is a picture from um, a little white while ago before we hit Verizon, so you can see the grapes are still kind of green. But I wanted to show you guys this picture just to show you how these vines are literally growing into the rock. It's not, you know, well, it's rocky soil. It, I mean, it is literally rock. It, it's insane just how vines can thrive in these conditions. And when you taste this wine and when Chris talks about crushed rock and, and sort of hot, uh, I, I forget, scorched earth, I think is the word, the term he uses, you know, this is what he's talking about. He's talking about these rocks that get baked by the sun all day long and they just resonate uh, warmth into the vineyard in the, during the cool nights and it helps those wine, those, those grapes mature. And so I think that this is a really visually stunning picture to look at um, because you get a sense for just how rocky it is over on those northern uh, those northern blocks. Um, here, oh, here's <laughs> here's William. Uh, when we took him out there, figured I'd give a shout out to my boy. He was uh, on a walk with us out there, and obviously, you can see he's getting bigger and bigger. But uh, fun to fun to take the family out there. And then here's just you know, I thought this would be a nice image to kind of cap it all off. This is later in the evening when the moon is just starting to rise, and you look over the slopes, and I think you get a bit of an indication of just how. This vineyard has steep parcels. It has a, a lower lying part as well. It's got little, you know, uh, peaks and valleys and it's got everything in between. There's a lot of diversity here. And I got to imagine uh, from a winemaker's perspective that that's really what you want when you're growing Cabernet at the highest possible class. You want a lot of diversity. You want a lot of tools to work with. So I hope you guys enjoyed kind of getting a little rooted in the vineyard there. Um, I'm going to go ahead and, and see if Chris is available so we can bring him on and he can touch a little bit more on that. Let's see. I don't see him here. Maybe I'll try to hit him up on the text. Sometimes they join with different names and things like that. Um, if not, then I guess we'll be tasting wine with me. And that will be fun, but we'll get him in here momentarily. Says he's on. He's texting me. He says he's on. So um chris what uh name are you under what uh what should i search here in the search bar because i'm not seeing chris tynan pop up there if you want to comment in the chat that might help us too and that way i can track you down because i've got all kinds of people let's see we got people from puerto rico jumping in people are having some songbook we got mark and trisha from vegas Excellent. We've got, let's see, we've got Kathy and Steve from Kansas City. I love Kansas City. It's been way too long since I've been there. Need to get back on the road a little bit. Let's see, we've got Brittany there. So let's see, Chris, are you making a comment in the chat there? Oh, okay. Uh, under Brit, maybe? Hmm. Who else we got? Scottsdale, Lisa and Dan. Thanks for joining, guys. It's been a while since I've been up there as well. I'm ready to travel again, as I'm sure everybody, everybody truly is. St. Louis. Nice. Good barbecue out in Missouri. Miss that as well. That's one of the main things I miss about traveling the most, the food. Food and the people, of course. All right. So now, oh, there's Dina. I see Dina in there. Hi, Dina. Hope Chicago's treating you well. Dina, everybody, everybody is our new um, national senior national sales director. So hi, Dina. Thanks for joining. All right. It sounds like we've got our technical difficulties figured out here. It might be under a different name, so we're going to see how this goes. So Brittany Gieske is our marketing uh, manager marketing let's see if we can ask to and it's chris tynan there we go 
<laughs> you know, I think I said this was our seventh or eighth go around and, and <laughs> having things like this happen, this. I don't even know what to say anymore. You know? <laughs> I'm not Brittany. Sorry. I actually think it's, you know, I, I think it's actually a good thing because it's showing that we're, we're not on zoom all the time anymore. Like we've, we've been able to kind of get out of that craziness when it was just zoom meeting after zoom meeting after zoom meeting. So everybody, this is, this is, this is Chris Tynan. This is not, this is not Brittany. Um, so welcome, Chris. Welcome to the, welcome to the show. Actually, I, I can I can rename you, so I'm going to go ahead and do that. That'll make yeah. it a little bit more clear to everyone. There we go, Chris Tynan. So, Chris, how are you today? I'm doing uh, excellent. Um, we are we've just started harvest here for 2021. This is my tenth harvest here at Cliff Lady Vineyards, um, and so this Monday we picked some old vine Simeon up in Calistoga. Yep. And uh, and then yesterday we picked some of a state uh, Sauvignon Blanc from our Twin Peaks estate and from our Calistoga vineyard. Um, probably some of the best uh, whites we've picked in the last 10 years. There's really, really amazing perfume, fresh acidity. Um, it's looking like a really amazing year. And, um, you know, we're worried about a smaller crop this year because of the drought, but we had a very nice even um, pick. And so looking forward to continuing on throughout the rest of the vintage with uh, good weather and, and good quality. Fingers crossed, like literally every finger crossed that things just from here on out kind of maintain the way they've been. I mean, the season so far has just been awesome. Few little, you know, days of heat here and there. We got some more come this weekend, but uh, you know, truly it's been like knock on wood. It's been great. It's been great. So, and you've got a lot of pressure on this, on this vintage because, um, you know, if you don't mind me letting everybody know, you're actually expecting uh, your first child as well. Yes, my wife is due in about seven weeks, hopefully, if it goes the whole whole way. Um, so the sooner we can get in some good grapes, the better, because I'm going to be a little, <laughs> busy, a little bit busy here coming up. Um, so an early harvest is welcome this year with, with, the, with the, you know, the drought is going to help that. So it couldn't have come at a better time. Yeah, absolutely. Well, um, I'm sure the 2021s will be great because I know you'll want to you'll want to make them as good as you possibly can. But uh, we're going to talk about the vintages that we're going to taste today, and I think it would be a, obviously a great um, place to start with that with that 2008 poetry. I'm going to get some of that in the glass here. And so, Chris, I know I know you didn't um, work on this wine, but uh, you know you're you have such a more expert and refined uh, palate than I do. So. I think for our viewers, it would be best if if you could taste this and just just tell us your thoughts, where you think it's at, you know, ageability. Would you pair some food with this? What are you tasting in the glass? What are you smelling? What do you think? To me, this feels like a wine that's just kind of shed its early little baby fat. I mean, it still feels like a very very young wine, um, mm. but it's starting to enter that um, what we in what we kind of term in poetry is kind of like the blossoming in bottle. It's just this, um, you know, poetry can be kind of austere and um, a little bit shy when it's young, depending on the vintage. Um, but this is a wine that's, the aromatics are really just starting to burst out of the glass and the, the tannins are becoming softer and more refined. And um, all of the elements are kind of integrated. All the different, uh, you know, Cab Merlot, Cab Franc, Petit Bordeaux are kind of like merging together and it's becoming like a whole. Um, but I think you're just at the beginning of it. it's kind of like, you know, youthful traje trajectory of, of its long life. So it's it's a really stylish wine and really pretty and fun and um, and kind of, you know, tells the tale of poetry that we've been telling now for almost 20 years about just um, about the potential of this vineyard and how, how great it's getting. And um, you can see that, definitely see the, the connection when you taste the 18 as well, because you can, mm -hmm. you can see a young, young vineyard becoming uh, maturing and and really establishing itself you know it, the 2018 is um it's still in those teenage years for the vines and they're still getting established but already the potential is just unreal from that vineyard it's it's pretty amazing and just your pictures were great i mean that was a really great shot of those rocks because that's what we're dealing with up there is very shallow soils the resulting clusters are just very small the berries are very very small and that results in a very perfumed and concentrated wine. That's what we love. Absolutely. 
So, I mean, this 2008, from your perspective, I mean, this is, this is ready to go. It's ready to enjoy now, probably, you know, another five plus years of, of kind of that, that prime enjoyment that at that top end of the plateau. What, what do you think? Oh, I think maybe even beyond that, I think okay. no rush to drink this wine. I think it's just going to get better probably for another, it's going to be up on that plat plateau for another 10, 15 years. And then we'll, we'll check in there. We'll see how it's doing. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. And then, I mean, I know we're talking Cabernet. So I think, you know, if we're talking food with this wine, we're probably thinking something on the grill, some red meat. Would you maybe prepare something a little bit different for something that's got age on it? Like what, what would you typically do if you're doing like an older California wine or something that's, you know, bringing a little bit more of those aged qualities? Well, when you're drinking the poetry, I think that's the star of the night. So absolutely, you're gonna, I would say buy a, a piece of, of meat that um, is, is just a good piece of meat that you're not going to have to season up a lot with too much um, spices and stuff like that. You really want the kind of a, a good quality piece, piece of beef to, to pair with this. And, um, and then that, that wine's just going to cut through the fat. And uh, I, I really think that's, you know, just a wonderful pairing. It's, that's what I'm, I'm fond of. I'm definitely on the same page as you. I, I like to cook very like simple and then let the wine kind of be the star of the show, as you mentioned. Um, you know, it is it is a fun wine to go back and and taste now that it's been, I guess, 13 years since that since that harvest. Um, you know, definitely a different time. I know that we re, we actually took some of the vineyards out in 07. So the 08 would have been, I think, primarily then sourced from the older blocks. And thus, you know, the blocks on that north side that I was that I was talking to through the pictures there. Um, so I, I, you know, I must, I got to think that, you know, back then uh, you just had less to select when you were making that wine. You know, you kind of had the established blocks and that was, you know, you took the best of the best from there. I'm sure the production was smaller in 08 as well because of that um, versus now, you know, 2018, it's like, you've got the whole hillside that's in production, you know, um, maybe, you know, the younger vines are, I guess there are a couple little blocks that are, that are maybe only five or six years old, but everything else is, is like you mentioned in, in its teen years. So anyway, um, I think it's tasting great. Very cool wine. I mean, that wine was actually, um, made with, uh, Philippe Melka consulting. So that's kind of cool, you know, very well known, uh, winemaker here in Napa Valley. Um, he was here only for a few years. So I guess fun fact about that wine, but, um, get it while you can, because we only do these re-releases you know, so often and, and they're only available for a limited time. Um, but with that, maybe we should shift gears, get to the 2018, which I'm sure is what everybody is, is really wanting to, to talk and hear about. Um, because I mean, hey, this is, this is our, our second 100 point Robert Parker wine advocate wine, second one ever. And, you know, obviously congratulations to you and the winemaking team, Chris, that's a, an incredible, um, achievement, but this is the second time around. So, <laughs> you know, how, do, how does that feel? I mean, like it's, I, I've never won, like, you know, I'm not a hockey player. It's not like I won the Stanley cup or, you know, once or twice, I, I have no idea. I'm sure it's great both times, but you know, 200 point wines for, for me, I mean, I was equally as excited about this and tasting the wine. I mean, I'm just blown away. Um, but for a winemaker, for the winemaking team, like how, how is it maybe different from 2013 to the 2018? Oh boy. Uh, you mean just as, as a, as a feeling of, of getting that. I guess in general, right? Like, like, let me put it this way. In 2013, you probably didn't expect to get, to get a perfect score. You know, you'd been at the winery for only a couple harvests and it was, it probably really caught you by surprise. And then every year since then, you've kind of been like nipping at the heels of it, right? We're getting 98s and 99s and, so like, I, I guess it's like, how does it feel now that you've, you've done it again, you know? <laughs> oh, well, um, you know, it's one of the things that as a winemaker, when you've got a wine that you feel is really, really good um, and you almost, you, you know, it's good in your heart because you can taste it and, and you know what goes into it. And, and, um, and so even before someone gives it hundred points, you feel like, oh, I think this wine is pretty damn good. And, and no matter what anybody says about it, I'm pretty sure this wine's gonna be 
be pretty amazing. Um, we felt that in 13 and, um, and then felt it again in 2018 for sure. Um, I, I, you know, I told your dad, I told Cliff one day long before the score came out that, you know, that the, I thought the 2018 poetry was going to get a hundred points. And, uh, and he said, Oh, you, <laughs> you can't say that you better get a hundred points. Now you, you can't, you can't say that one now you it's got to come in. So luckily, luckily we did get a, a, a couple of good, really high scores from everybody uh, that, that reviewed it. And, um, and then 100 points from 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 the wine advocate. So that was that was pretty special. Um, and just to put it in perspective, I think uh, you know our 2019s are even better than our 2018s, and that's that's saying a lot. So we've got two two amazing vintages coming on board here. So uh, I like I like you know they'll do 111 points. I have I'll take, uh, yes. I'll take it to 11. <laughs> you know, take it up a notch. Maybe I want maybe that first 100 110 point score. wine. Yeah, <laughs> even 101 points. That'd be cool. <laughs> Um, but no, congratulations to you guys. I mean, I'm sure that was, that was, uh, well-deserved I, and, and, and not fully expected, but, you know, I, I'm, I'm of the opinion that, you know, there's, there's plenty of hundred point wines made all the time. I think, I think you have made more than what you've been recognized. I know there's a lot of factors that can go into that coming out. I mean, maybe, you know, this might be a useful, um, piece of information, but, as far as you're aware, when uh, Lisa from the Wine Advocate tastes the wine, like like how does how does that process happen? How did how how do they you know how does how do we get the wine to her and and maybe give everybody a little insight on that? Um, some critics will come taste with us, and as far as uh, Lisa Parati Brown from the Wine Advocate, she um, we were part of the Napa Valley's Napa, excuse me Napa Valley Vintners tasting. So um, a group of uh, of Napa Valley wineries will submit their wines and. Um, kind of poured in a group setting. Um, and so in some ways that makes it a little bit more special too, because of, um, you know, we're, our wines are tasted amongst, you know, the best of the best of Napa Valley. And when you're rewarded with something, you know, a high mark like that, um, it's, it's, so to me, it makes it even a little bit more special. So, um, mm -hmm. you know, it's, uh, there's, there's less, uh, there's less noise between, um, you know, there's no fancy tricks. We just give them the wine and they open it and they taste it. And right. um, it's, it's, it feels, it feels a little bit more um, authentic in, in some aspects. So, yeah. Um, yeah. It, it's just nice to be recognized for sure that anyone thinks your wine is, is perfect. So that's nice. And you've had other hundred point wines, right? Like you personally, and with your own label have made a hundred pointer. Um, was that back in, 13 or, or 15? Sure. My own label. Um, I received a couple hundred points for, for my, my own label couple. from Parker and, um, and from Jeb Dunnick, a couple hundred pointers from him. Um, nice. Um, and then, you know, some of our other wines have received hundred points as well from, mm -hmm. for Cliff Lady. Our Tokalon's gotten a hundred points, I believe from Jeb Dunnick a couple times, poetry a yep. couple times. So, um, it wasn't our, it, it, for, for, for sure, the first wine from Poetry in 2013 was pretty special. Your, your first 100-point wine is, is, is pretty memorable. I think we were pretty, mm -hmm. pretty excited about that. But, um, you know, it's a curse because once you get 100 points, everyone expects you to get 100 points every year. So, you know, if you're right. 98, they, they think, you know, what happened? What went wrong? And you're like, damn, it's 98 points. It's pretty damn good. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, enough, you know, talk about points. Um, let's taste this wine and let's sort of give an idea of, of what you're tasting in the glass and, and how, you know, the site that we were, that we've been talking about, like how that translates through and what, and what you're picking up and what, you know, what makes this wine distinctly poetry? Um, you know, it's kind of the fun thing about tasting the 08 and the 2018 together is that, you know, the terroir is really what, what, you know, binds these wines and, and, um, you know, just those shallow shallow rocky soils you just get this rockiness stoniness in the wine and the aromatics um and what i think maybe the 18 is a little different is that the perfume um is just so elegant and so um uh, just so pretty there's violets and lilacs and uh, all sorts of just pretty perfume aromatics um along with cardamom and blackberry cassis uh, all these luscious fruits and everything just seems to be 
um, in well balanced. I think that, you know, a great wine should just be equal parts of little bits of greatness. And um, it definitely just makes you go back and want to smell and smell time and time and again. And, um, and, and just with great wines, I think they taste really great early on as well. You know, you, it's still this wine's young and it's still powerful and, and it needs time, but damn, it's hard. It's hard not to crack a bottle right now. It's just showing so well. I think that's the home, one of the hallmarks of 2018 vintage as well, across from, from our Stag's Ape Cab up to the poetry, the Topolon and Songbook. Um, 2018 is going to just be a beautiful vintage to drink early in middle age and in old age. It's just, it's um, just a profound vintage for us. Well, I'm tasting a bottle that, uh, the bottle that we opened, um, I guess, two days ago mm -hmm. when we were tasting with the team. And um, this tastes magnificent. <laughs> so, you know, I, I always like to tell people when they when they call in or when they're at the tasting room, you know, when should I open the wine? Like an hour before dinner? And I'm like, you could literally open it the morning before. <laughs> like <laughs> you could give these wines a lot of air. Obviously you want to keep them cool and in the right conditions. Um, but but wow, is, is there a refinement to this wine? I would say that's probably for me, the one thing that stands out the most from you know, through the vintages that I've tasted that you've made, there, there's just a, a, a overwhelming refinement. And, and um, I don't really like the word polished because it sounds like it was like really worked on, like it, like it was like manufactured, but it, it, I think refinement's the right way to put that. There's just the, the, the texture, the flavors, everything's just beautifully in line. Um, I'm excited to see how like this is going to go down the road. I mean, is this going to be a wine that year after year after year is just you know slowly evolving and just delicious the, along you know along the way does it have a a quiet phase at any point um you know when is that and then when does it just really explode with all those aged qualities when is it sort of in its prime i mean it could be 20 years from now it could be could be 30 years from now mm. i think there's there's an effortlessness about it you know it just seems like Although we put an immense amount of effort into it, it just seems like it's just an easy wine. It's just really pretty and, 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 and um, integrated already. Um, I, you know, I, I think one of the other things, um, as long with, along with the vines getting a little bit older and maturing, um, our experience with, with the vineyard um, is getting better and better. You know, 10 years working with the same, same grape, same land, you really get to know the vines very well. Um, you get to know the sweet spots of blocks and you get to help little sections that maybe are underperforming. So there's a lot of um, things that we've learned throughout the, the 10 vintages that I've been here too that um, really contribute to some of that. So uh, I'm very lucky to work with these grapes. They're just, it's an amazing, special, to me, it's one of the Grand Cru's of Napa Valley. So mm -hmm. very lucky to work with it. Yeah, this, I mean, this, this range of uh, the Vaca Mountains, right, that runs all the way, you know, the length of the valley, you think about some of the, the vineyards that are on this sort of mountain range. I mean, we're talking about Schaefer Hillside, um, the Joseph Phelps um, Bacchus vineyard, right? Is that, is that, yeah, the Bacchus vineyard, that's, mm -hmm. that's just north, uh, north. I mean, you've got Della Valle that's up there. You know, the, we're, we are finally, I, I believe, putting this vineyard on the map. I mean, when I say we, I mean, you know, you and Allison and everybody that's really just, crafting these incredible wines year after year after year after year, after year that you know soon um that's gonna you know that's what's gonna pop into people's minds when they think about this you know vaca mountain volcanic rock iconic vineyard iconic wine so cheers to you guys for for all that work is there any <clears throat> excuse me is there anything in the winery that you're doing a little differently since 2013, I know you 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 did that one lane where you put the smaller tanks in. I mean, is there any other innovations or things that you're working on? Oh, great point. I mean, that that was another thing um, coming here uh, to the working with Cliff Ladies since 2012. Um, one of the things Cliff allowed us to get was uh, smaller tanks. Um, mm -hmm. The section of the tank room that wasn't being used it was it was kind of almost storage with with some smaller porta tanks, and um, I convinced. Cliff at a 
um, to spend a lot of money getting us some small tanks because I was said this over like a few martinis or something or uh, well maybe some uh, a couple bottles of Bordeaux I think okay <laughs> and yep. I said we'll get we'll we'll make more wine and it'll taste a lot better if you can build this little section and you know if you can tweak the builder um, tweak the arm of the builder he's definitely going to go for it eventually because he likes to build mm -hmm. things and yep. we were finished just in time for the harvest of 2018 we've got a bunch of small little tiny little tanks that we can basically pick off uh, the poetry vineyard in um, little sections and just uh, really micromanage them even to even to a greater detail than we were doing before um, and so I think you know this, this wine speaks for itself and, and, and doing that one little tweak to the tank room really, um, you know, raised the bar and uh, allowed us to create an even better wine. So, so would you, so would you, in, 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 you know, just <clears throat> question, would you ferment blocks separately? Like, would you go into one of the larger blocks in poetry and sort of, and separate uh, that in, in a tank or, or would you just specifically do the smaller blocks and the singular tanks? It's vintage to vintage. Um, you know, it's, it's what we're tasting out in the vineyard starting uh, right after Parisian. We're watching flavors evolve. We're looking at clonal selections too. Um, and then we're getting a little creative. You know, if we've got um, a great block of clone six that's just dark and powerful, but maybe it needs a little subtlety. We might just, um, we might pick off a little, one row of Merlot to kind of add to co-ferment with that. It's just those little tiny tweaks. We might put a little 337 with some um, Isley clone Cabernet Sauvignon. We might, we might have some top terrace sections at the very top of poetry that you had photographed earlier. Um, that it's amazing, but again, might be a little too powerful. It might need a little subtlety. So we might, you know, take a, a half ton, quarter ton of, of cab from Twin Peaks and just kind of, um, see what those do together and see how they play together. So it's, it's allows us to be a little bit more creative and, um, and really just capture the, capture the vintage, capture the vintage. And so that's uh, next level. So, you, I mean, you're like pre blending and then co-fermenting and then using that later on to piece the wine together. Exactly. That's pretty cool. Yeah. There's a lot, a lot of little things and then matching Getting, getting to know how our vineyards react to certain barrel makers, certain cooperages. Mm -hmm. And then we're getting down to literally forests in France for certain oak trees that um, work best with our wines. I mean, it gets really down to the thickness and tightness of the grain of the oak and the toast. And um, it's, it's, there's a lot, we can get, we can geek out for a long time if you want to get into it. Um, but yeah, we're, we're really trying to, just make it's just little subtle changes that you can elevate you and get you into a higher echelon of, of what the wine tastes like and the quality. Right. And we never give up. We always want to get make it better. I mean, we never want to let rest on our, our laurels and, and we just want to make better and better wine every year. Awesome. So, I mean, we talked about 18, talked about eight. Um, you touched on 19 a little bit. Was there was there something in, in 2019? that was different from 18 that you think you know led to those wines maybe becoming uh your your preferred over the last two or oh gosh i would never i wouldn't want to say preferred but um sure because they're like uh yeah they're 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 my babies too so um that 19 was um a, just it was very similar to 18 i think you're gonna gonna get a lot of comparisons to 18 and 19 it's just two great vintages mm -hmm. um the 19 um, is a really fresh vintage, lots of fresh acidity, um, much like 18, um, maybe just a touch more concentrated, a touch more, um, a, just a little bit more of everything. Again, it's, uh, it's apples and apples and apples. You're, you're comparing <laughs> really great vintages. Um, and we just bottled those in July. So we're letting them sleep for a couple of weeks before we taste them. So. Um, we'll really get to know those wines over the next couple months, watching them and opening them and see how they come out of bottling and come together. But I'm guaranteeing you they're, they're going to be pretty amazing. So, so are you going to tell Cliff that you're going to get another hundred? I'm not going to do that again. because I, <laughs> <laughs> I did it once and I, and I came out on top and then I don't want to. I'm not gonna risk I think it. that's it. Yeah. Yeah. That seems, <laughs> that seems risky. That seems risky. I know he's the kind of guy that would probably 
he would he would yeah, the reaction actually the reaction that you had I, I could totally see that like that is exactly the way he would react that's it's like a little Ruth superstitious call- like that you know that's like Babe Ruth calling two two home runs in, in one game right exactly <laughs> pretty ambitious I wouldn't want to do that nice well I know that we uh we don't have any more wine to taste tonight so this isn't going to be a, a super long session um you know if anybody has questions anybody watching if you have questions for chris now's the time to throw them into the chat or the q a um let's see uh i got a question here a uh, question here from uh chris leary are, are the wines you like more or are, are there wines you like more than uh the critics choices so that's a cool question like you know sometimes there's wines that are rated higher than others throughout the portfolio um are there ones that you look at you're like I, you know i actually think that's better than that but I mean, I guess, you, you know, it's hard to specifically pick on a wine, but are there, I, mean, well, I guess, are there any underdogs that you don't see getting looked at? I think, well, kind of a, a uh, I may not be answering the question directly there, but I feel like our high fidelity, I feel like that that is a wine over the last few years that I've learned to make better uh, and better. I feel like it was, we started out pretty good, but we learned that um, with more Cabernet Franc, as a percentage, higher percentage in the blend, we're creating a more complex wine and a more um, a more long lived wine as opposed to when it was more merlot dominated. Um, and so that's something we just uh, that I've learned by recognizing the strengths of our vineyard and um, and uh, and and just seeing where our terroir is, our climate. Cap Franc is is a little bit more more hardy, more like Cabernet Sauvignon, um, and just when you can get the arom- aromatics right on Cabernet Franc, it's it's pretty amazing. Um, I agree with that. I, I I totally second that. I think high fidelity, that wine is outrageously good. But I also th- I think Songbook too. I think Songbook, you know, that wine not um, it, it, it rates well. Don't get me wrong. I mean, we we used to get ninety eight points and be like, oh my god, this is amazing, and it is. It is a huge achievement. But that's probably one that. At some point, I you know it's got to hit those triple digits. At some point, like it, it, it's just too, it's just too good to not. And, and maybe it's because you know it gets you know po- poetry. I, I don't know what it is, but that wine is just fantastic. And um, you you've already achieved the the triple digits with Tokelon, which is amazing. Um, great wine. But uh, let's get some more questions from everybody watching. It's great. We got a lot of questions tonight. Um, you know, here's a question that comes up uh, sometimes when we have visitors as well. And uh, they talk about whether or not the fires of, of 17 um, that, were, that were so close by, or of course, the, the fires last year that were, were close, but it, we were more impacted by the smoke. Um, do those fires affect the future vintages? So did the 17 fire affect the 18 vintage in any way, shape or form? Did the 20 fires affect the 21 vintage in any way, shape or form. Do you have any, um, any comment on that, Chris? Yeah, the, the, the fire damage doesn't translate to the new vintage. Basically there's, once the grapes are gone from the smoky vintage, there's no residual effect on, on any of the plants or, um, or any of the grapes. So that's, there's one blessing there that you, you know, if you've got a fire one year that it's not gonna affect the next few years. It affects us and the fact that we, um, are more vigilant and um, about uh, the quality. Of course, we're not making the 2020 wine because the entire vintage was 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 smoke tainted. So, um, but this year we've been very blessed there. Although you have, I'm sure all the people across the country and uh, the world are hearing a lot about fires in, in California this year and they're tragic. Um, if there's if there's any luck to it, they're very very far away from us and the coastal breeze um, coming off the ocean. Um, this year has been very beneficial to us. It's kept our air very clean. So right now we have a we have a a, a really great vintage uh, in our hands um, that could change in a heartbeat, as we know. Uh, but right now there's no nothing to worry about over residual years. Um, so uh, great. So just to you know make sure that we clarify a couple of things because I did see a question here about you know the 2020 vintage and the smoke and so just so you know everyone's aware there, there will be no 2020 cliff lady wines at all there won't be any Sauvignon Blanc poetry stag Zeep cab we decided not to make any 2020 wines um, we're fortunate we have 
a beautiful 2018 vintage that was bountiful and is um, just starting to hit the market. And we also have another great vintage with 2019 where we got a little creative and uh, blended some different wines that we've never made before that we'll be offering as well to kind of help us get through that that cycle. Um, and then with 2021, as Chris mentioned, uh, so far looking very promising. So there won't be a 2020 from Cliff Lady, but if you are familiar with our sister winery, Fell Wines in the Anderson Valley, we do have a 2020 vintage from there. We didn't see the same, um, we didn't see really any of the smoke impacts up there that we saw down in Napa. Those fires were just, I mean, they were literally on top of us. <laughs> and that smoke was so dense in 2020 in Napa, but not so much in the Anderson Valley. So we're, we're thrilled that the 20s that we've tasted so far from Fell Wines have just been out of this world good. So um, there'll be more on that as we get into the new releases from Fell, which will be coming, uh, you know, over the next year or so. So for those Fell Wines fans, we'll have more info on, on those and, and uh, some new releases as well. Um, so uh, let's see what else we've got in the question line up here. I'll take a quick one. Looks like it's more uh, for me. This is um, a question around uh, hospitality and, and visitation. Um, sounds like uh, Carol's coming out to Napa in September. And uh, are there any concerns that, that tasting rooms will close down? At this point, I haven't heard anything about there being concerned about being closed down again. Um, there have been certain adjustments that have taken place. Masks are now required indoors um, at restaurants and tasting rooms when you're not sort of actively eating or, or drinking. So if you get up from your table, things like that, we still host the majority of our tastings outside. So if you're you know, sensitive to that, um, you're more than welcome to join us and, and have a tasting outside either on our veranda with reserve tasting or do the VIP tasting if you wanna taste um, some of Chris's uh, best wines that we make. So uh, of course, we'd love to see you. We are open and we are uh, intending to be, I believe, through the fall, I, unless something really crazy happens. Um, but I think at this point, we've found ways to um, show people a great time, have a really high level of service and, and, and you know, offer wine tastings. So I don't, I don't foresee that happening. So uh, thanks for that question, Carol. It's a great question. Uh, Warren's got a question here um, for you, Chris. W when selecting barrels, do you mix different types of oak in the same barrel to get the specific result you're trying to obtain in the wine? So that do you- Good question. Do this, yeah. Um, well, we only use French oak. So that's our overarching um, source for the, the staves or for our oak, oak barrels. Mm -hmm. um, oftentimes a cooperage will um, utilize a proprietary blend of forests to can make a consistent barrel year to year to year. So you know exactly what you're getting. Um, you've got different species of oak in France, slightly different species that will affect the flavor and then where they're grown, cold, cold climates or warmer climates. And then as the um, trees are cut down in staves, where the staves are aged because um, the raw wood is very harsh. And so we, we don't buy any barrels that uh, where the staves haven't been aged for more than three years. So that's, you know, four different seasons and three different years. So you've got rain and snow and rain and snow and rain and rain. Um, that really leaches out a lot of the harsh character of the wood. Um, we pay more for that because it's more expensive to, to have someone wait around for years to, to build the barrel. Um, and then we toast, we have our specific toast that we like. So some barrels, some cooperages, we like a little heavier toast and some coopers we very do very, very light toast. Um, and each cooperage has its own signature style. And we really work closely with the best producers of French oak barrels um, to, to kind of capture uh, what we do best here at, at Cliff Lady. So perfect. Hopefully that explains your, your question, Warren. Got another question here um, that I like from, uh, from Bart. Could you compare the, the profile of 2018 poetry and 2018 songbook. I like this question because Chris and I had lunch with a, a group today and he actually pulled out the 2018 songbook as a, as a bit of a preview. So it was the first time I tasted it. And so I saw a pretty large difference in the two wines. Both are incredible wines, but just they did taste different. So Chris, what's your perspective on poetry and songbook? Uh, what, what do you kind of feel is the main, the main difference? 
Well, poetry is, is you know, a singular expression of one specific site here at Stag's Leap District, it's a very small location where we are. Um, so that kind of, you know, the terroir from this section really screams, whereas Songbook is a blend of Madrona Ranch vineyard that David Avery farms just west in the hills west above uh, St. Lena. And then, which is, that soil is very rocky, very gravelly. The Cab and Cab Franc that come from that vineyard are probably the closest thing to Bordeaux that we can grow here in Napa. It's just so gravelly, so rocky, and it has that gravelly, stony uh, character to the wine that you can only get in, in Grave or you know on the left bank of Bordeaux. And then we also get Cabernet Sauvignon from David's Lucia Vineyard, which is in the Las Posadas section of uh, Howell Mountain. So quite a different terroir. You're up, you know, 1,800 feet up into the up into the mountains there. Very surrounded by pine forests. Very, um, you get a lot of mountain tannin from there. Big, big kind of uh, where normally Howell Mountain is very rustic. With the way David farms it, he gets these beautiful, smooth, suave tannins out of Howell Mountain. I don't know how he does it. He's he's a genius farmer. Um, so two different terroirs from Napa Valley that are kind of coming together. Cab Franc and Cab from uh, from the Journal Ranch, and and then of course more, more Cab, and we sneak in a little Merlot and Cab uh, Merlot and Petit Verdot in there as well. Um, and so that so the songbook kind of comes at, across as more as a an, an amazing high level blend from Napa Valley because uh, it doesn't you know it's two different terroirs together. Um, and boy, the eighteen songbook is pretty off the charts too. It's it's pretty amazing, pretty special and unique. It's not a wine. It, taste like anything else that we make. Very, very special. Mm -hmm. Love it. So Chris, how many hundred point wines have you had? Do you know? Have I made or have I have tasted? Have you had? Have you consumed? Oh gosh. Uh, I, I couldn't, I'm, I'm probably a lot, I have to say. So <laughs> uh, quite a few over my years because I'm interested in collecting and I like to find uh -huh. out what people think is, 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 is the best wine. And so do you feel like this 2018 poetry fits in with that group that you've, that you've tasted over the years? Well, that's why I was, that's why I was pretty, uh, going out, out of my modest, um, uh, usually pretty modest, I guess I would say that's what people say about me anyway. Uh, I'd say that. Yeah. I was confident enough to say that to your dad. So I guess I felt like it was pretty damn good. Yeah. <laughs> it well, was awesome. That was, that was, that was, sorry. It was worthy of a hundred point score. I thought so. it is. It, I mean, yeah, this is even for being open for as long as it has been. I mean, I just, it, it's just wonderful, man. That wine's going to age beautifully. Um, but that pretty much, uh, Oh, wait, I, I got one question. One last question from Dina. She wants to know what your favorite Bordeaux is, Chris, real quick. Oh gosh. Well, your dad opened up an 89 Hope Rion one time for dinner and, I think the whole table just got really, really quiet. <laughs> we, we put our nose into that. It, I looked across the room at, at this master song that we used to work with and we locked eyes and we were like, holy, wow, whoa, this is good. So yeah, that's my favorite one of those, one that I've ever had. One of those wines that there's just never like enough in the bottle. Like it no. just goes and you're like, where, where did it go? <laughs> and an hour it's later when you got the last little sip and you're like, oh, it's even better than it was. Yeah. Like, Damn it. Oh man. Well, thank you, Chris, for your time to jump on tonight. And thank you, everybody who uh, joined us on our webinar. Uh, this has been great. I appreciate your insight. Um, the wines are tasting beautifully. Again, everybody, you know, for Platinums, you've got basically one more day to add on to your, to your uh, allocation. So get it while it's hot. And for everybody else, uh, keep an eye out for the offering letter coming out, email, I should say, offering email coming out next week. So uh, with that, uh, everybody, if you have any questions or anything, please shoot us an email, give us a call, reach out to us, come see us. We'd love to have you out to the Valley if you're, if you're ready to travel. Um, but it, it's about that time that uh, I better get out of this room before the guests come back and, and kick me out. <laughs> I'm just kidding. It's like the one night, the one room, one night, there's nobody here and then they'll, uh, they'll have guests tomorrow. So anyway, thank you all for visiting. Appreciate you guys. And uh, Chris, thank you so much. Cheers to you and your team. Congratulations on the 100 points. It's amazing. And uh, well, we'll see how 2021 goes, buddy. Exactly.
Cheers. Thanks, right. Jason. Bye, everyone.